Chapter 22. Evan rummaged through the old man's closet, feeling for heavy winter jackets or at least thick wool. The dark, damp basement already reeked of molds, and as he reached deeper into the garments, the scent of mothballs danced with the must in his nostrils. He felt a coarse jacket and pulled it out onto the faint daylight, coming through the small window above his head. It was a formal military blazer. He recognized it from Remembrance Day ceremonies and grand entries at powwows. He remembered the old man looking proud and mighty every time he put it on. But here, in this lonely, near-empty basement, it looked stiff and rotting. Evan held it higher for a better look. The blue wool had faded and felt thin. He noticed that the buttons on the sleeves and the breasts weren't actually gold as he had always thought as a child. They were brass and tarnished. He ran his callous fingertip across the three smaller ones on the jacket's left wrist, feeling the bumps and grooves of the tiny crests. He pictured the old man holding the eagle staff proudly, wearing this military garb. The button's golden charm had seemed to accentuate the flags and feathers on the ceremonial stave. But they no longer shone. They never did, really. Evan wondered if Remembrance Day would ever happen again. The wood furnace in the middle of the room blasted heat that dissipated as it reached the unfinished concrete walls. He replaced the jacket and closed the closet door, then fed another five pieces of wood into the furnace. Isaiah would come later in the evening to feed the fire again for the old lady. Eileen was sitting at the kitchen table, sipping from the tea she had promised Evan. She still had an old wood cook stove in her kitchen, and she could handle keeping it stoked, but she was too frail now to load the furnace in the basement. The main floor was toasty, and it comforted Evan to know that Eileen was okay. He took off his jacket and placed it on the back of the wooden chair across from the elder. She put down her cup and smiled at him through her big glasses. Everything okay down there, she asked. Evan looked down at the full cup in front of him, then to hers. She had wrapped her thin, wrinkled fingers around the hot glass for warmth. The sleeves of her pink sweater were fraying at the end. Yep, everything looks good. You got lots of wood still, he replied. Izzy will be by tonight to top it up. I really appreciate you boys doing this for me. Chi miigwech. It's nothing, auntie. We're happy to help. Eileen was the last of the generation raised speaking Anishinaabe one with little English at all. She was one of only a few dozen left who could speak their language fluently. She remembered the old ways and a lot of the important ceremonies. She had more knowledge than everyone else about the traditional lives, lives of the Anishinaabe. Me know ya, I'm warm. I have lots to eat. I get a lot more company these days. That's good. We want to make sure everything's okay around here. How are you doing? He paused. He couldn't remember the last time someone had asked him that. His face had been frenetic in the strange darkness of this new era. I'm, uh, good, I guess. How are the kids? Oh, they're good. They've been spending a lot of time outside. I don't think they miss school at all. He chuckled, and she giggled. What about your bazgim? Oh, she's tired, but she's getting by. She really appreciates all the things you were teaching her about the old medicine ways. But she still gets stuck at home a lot with the kids while I'm out here doing stuff. Well, you make sure you spend some time with her. Go for a walk in the bush. When the spring comes, ask her to show you some of the medicines. She'll know a lot now if she remembers all the stuff from when I used to take her and all the young girls out there. It will be important if we don't get any new supplies in, the in from the hospital down south. Evan thought of Nicole at home, trying to prepare herself for the skills they would need if the power was gone for good while struggling to keep the children occupied. He felt a twinge of guilt. She often looked tired these days. She didn't talk as much as she used to and hardly smiled anymore. No one smiled much this winter. That's a good idea, he said. Maybe I'll take the kids over to my parents' place tomorrow, or the day after. Your mom will appreciate the cucum time. Yeah, for sure. He brought the hot tea to his chapped lips and sipped. The liquid seeped into the cracks and burned, but he showed no reaction. He'd learned to keep his thoughts behind a careful mask. He could not show weakness, especially now. But the old woman could still make him smile. Did you find anything down there in Eddie's closet? She asked. I found one of his old army jackets, but I didn't want to take it. <clears throat> the one he wore for ceremonies? Yeah, that one. Ah, yes, he loved that one. She looked out the window. 
Her husband had served in the Korean War and had been the last wartime military veteran in the community. He had died four years ago, disappointed that no young people had followed in his path. He had been celebrated as a strong warrior and a respected elder. I haven't thought about him now, wondering if he would have been able to help guide the young people through this catastrophe if he were still alive. Evan sipped the tea slowly. There was no need to fill the silence. If we can make it through this winter, Evan thought, we'll be okay. Often, Eileen shared a teaching or an old story with the young men when they came to visit. Once in a while, someone would bring a group of children or teens to hear some old Nanabush stories or her memories of the old days. There had been no electricity in this community when she was a child, and parents sometimes brought the young ones to her to remind them that life was possible without the comforts of modern technology. Now, it was critical that they learn how the old ones lived on the land. You know, when young people come over, sometimes some of them talk about the end of the world, Eileen said, breaking the silence and snapping Evan out of his wool gathering. He looked up from his play pattern on the vinyl tablecloth to the old woman's face. They say that this is the end of the world. The power's out and we've run out of gas and no one's come up from down south. They say the food is running out and that we're in danger. There's a word they say too, uh, poc, uh, apocalypse? Yes, apocalypse. What a silly word. I can tell you there's no word like that in Ojibwe. Well, I never heard a word like that from my elders anyway. Evan nodded, giving the elder his full attention. The world isn't ending, she went on. Our world isn't ending. It's already ended. It ended when the Zagnash came into our original home down south on that bay and took it from us. That was our world. When the Zagnash cut down all the trees and fished all the fish and forced, forced us out of there, that's when our world ended. They made us come all the way up here. This is not our homeland. But we had to adapt and luckily we already knew how to hunt and live on the land. We learned to live here. She became more animated as she went on. Her small hands swayed as she emphasized the words she wanted to highlight. But then they followed us up here and started taking our children away from us. That's when our world ended again. And that wasn't the last time. We've seen what this, what's the word again? Apocalypse. Yes, apocalypse. We've had that over and over. But we always survived. We're still here. And we'll still be here, even if the power and the radios don't come back on and we never see any white people ever again. Evan gazed back down to the table. He felt his shoulders ease and his chest open up. He was tired, but she gave him hope. You're right, auntie, he said. I never thought of it this way. He smiled and she smiled back, crow's feet creasing at the corners of her eyes. Well, I should probably head back out there, he said, as he tipped back the cup into his mouth. Okay then, busy day? Not really, just gotta tie up some loose ends. He didn't want to tell her the morbid details of his next task. He got up and put on his jacket and zipped it up. He took the black toque out of his right pocket and pulled it over his shaggy black hair, which nearly hung into his eyes. He said miigwech and smiles before walking out the back door. His sturdy yellow snowshoes were propped up against the porch. Evan sat on the step and his hands bare, threaded the leather straps through the metal buckles at, his, at the heels and toes of both feet. He lifted each foot and shook it to ensure the, the shoe was snug. He shooed around to the front of the house and threw the deep snow on the driveway. The snow continued to fall as it had for days, whiting out nearly everything, save for the homes and the trees that were tall enough to rise above the snow line. He looked back at Eileen's house one more time and saw her in the large picture window waving. He smiled and waved back. The smoke coming from the chimney put him at ease. She would be okay for another day. He walked onto the road, now devoid of trucks and cars. Once the diesel supply became critically low, the plows had stopped running. Most of the town's trucks and cars had run out of gas anyway. Within a, f within a few days of steady snowfall, the roads had become impassable. Two weeks earlier, the diesel had finally run out. It came as little surprise to most. Still, it had resulted in a handful of frustrated people storming the shop to demand some sort of solution, still clinging to the idea that other people could fix their problems. In reality, there was a small amount of diesel left for one last burst to boost the generators to reconnect to the hydro grid 
if it were to come back online, or to fuel up vehicles once again for some sort of voyage somewhere to get supplies or connect with another community to consolidate resources. Either possibility seemed remote. So Evan was now doing his rounds on foot, checking in on the elderly or those who needed help keeping their fires burning or making food. He didn't really have an official job anymore. The band administration had essentially dissolved, save for organizing weekly food handouts from the cache. Some people still saw Terry and the rest of the council as the figureheads of the community, but their influence was greatly diminished. Walter was the one council member most people now turned to if they needed a problem solved. And Walter, in turn, relied on Evan, Isaiah, and Tyler. Otherwise, people had retreated to their family groups or had now fallen under the spell of Justin Scott's promises of easier living under his authority. Alliances were forming and shifting, and Evan was uneasy. The hypnotic crunch of his steps was the only sound he heard on this still day. The afternoon chill was deep, and people kept indoors if they could. Gray smoke pumped from each chimney. The crust of the snow he broke was thicker than his snowshoes. He kicked up frozen shrapnel each time he raised a foot. A fine powder lay underneath. The conditions made him think of the specific time of year. There's a word for this, he thought, trying to remember with each high step across the hard snow. His knees raised as if to rev his mind into higher gear. He looked up to the lumpy clouds in the hope that the word would emerge like a ray of sunlight through overcast sky. Onabani Gizis, he proudly proclaimed out loud, the moon of the crusted snow. His words fell flat on the white ground in front of him, and he wondered which month that actually was. Onabani Gizis usually referred to February, but it could also apply to early March. He remembered hearing two teachers dispute about it when he was younger. One of them was convinced him at the time at the peak of winter, when the weather was so cold, the snow simply froze over. The other said it was later in the season, when the weather fluctuated between freezing and milder temperatures, causing the snow to melt and then freeze again, creating a crust. Evan thought it must still be deep winter and that this crust he was walking through was what the first teacher from his memory was talking about. There had been no mild weather yet. The deep freeze was unrelenting. The wind howled. Blizzards continued to blow in. There were calm, sunny days of bearable temperatures, but otherwise there was no real respite from the harshest of seasons here in the north. The crusted snow moon sounded severe to him. He agreed with the first teacher. This must be the peak of an Onabani Gizis, he thought. He had stopped counting the days and weeks long ago. There was no point anymore knowing if it was Tuesday the 21st of whatever. All that mattered was getting through each season and preparing for the next. Now, the milestones he used to mark time were the deaths in the community. The toll was rising steadily as people perished through sickness, mishap, violence, or by their own hands. Even in a place as familiar with tragedy as a northern reserve, it had reached levels he had never before experienced. Evan's trips to the band office, the elders' homes he served, and back home had become routine. He had trained trained himself to think deliberately, to ponder things that settled his mind. He thought about spots where they could gather more wood. He reviewed rabbit snare knots. He visualized pulling back an arrow and letting it fly at a target. He had discovered that reviewing routines in his head helped him keep desperation at bay. As long as the wind didn't blow too harshly and the snowfall abated, he even enjoyed these walks. He trudged up to the side of the garage at the band office. He opened the heavy green door that was never locked anymore and propped it open with a gray cinder block to let in some meager light. He stepped inside and went right to the chains that opened the garage door manually. He pulled down and it slowly lifted, letting in a sliver of white daylight underneath. A few more solid yanks of the chain and the door was up, illuminating the garage behind him. He ignored the rows of bodies wrapped in blankets and bags and stepped back outside to await the others. Two figures appeared on the hill in the distance, pulling a sled. Evan recognized his friends by the walk, even in snowshoes. They were immersed in conversation, making animated hand gestures. The two young men had become accustomed to their grim task as makeshift undertakers. The plastic sled scraped loudly against the hard snow, 
drowning out their voices as they, ne as they neared. Its heavy cargo dug into the crusty chunks and powder, sinking in slightly. The two seemed to ignore it as they greeted Evan. Hey, Ev, get a load of this fucking guy, said Isaiah. He figures Toronto would have been in a playoff spot by now. Fucking right they would have been, said Tyler. They had the hardest start ever, and if they kept it up, playoffs would have been starting pretty soon. Well, one of you is full of shit, that's for sure. Evan smiled, shaking his head. But I guess we'll never know who. Just watch. All this shit's going to come back on and we'll be in the playoffs. They've probably been playing this whole time and we've just been in the dark, said Tyler. He had, been, he had been one of the best young players on the reserve and had been scouted for a junior team in Gibson when he was 15. But there was a blizzard the day he was supposed to fly down, stranding him on the reserve, and the opportunity never rose again. Despite Tyler's, despite Tyler's optimism, Evan doubted the lights would ever come back on. Hockey as we know it is done, he thought. He shook off that notion and focused on the job they had to do. Today, it was Johnny Megas they would lay to rest in the garage. So how was it getting old Johnny here? Evan asked, jutting his chin towards the black body bag on the sled. It was difficult for him to square the long black lump before him with his mental image of the elder. Isaiah twisted to look back at the sled. He was pretty stiff by the time we got there, he said. We had trouble getting him into the bag. All his kids and grandkids were there, said Tyler. They were all pretty upset. It was a rough scene. Did they know what happened to him? Uh, seven. They think it was his heart or his diabetes. Probably a combination of things, added Isaiah, matter of factly. He was never one to reveal much emotion. Yeah, I guess we won't really know, stated Tyler. Too bad, anyways. They left it at that and pulled the sled into the garage. It was a tragic routine the three of the three had been assigned early in, earlier in the winter, and it had become one of their primary jobs now that there wasn't any more plowing to do. When word got around that there was a death, it was up to them to collect the body and bring it here to the garage, where it weighed out the winter. The community would bury their loved ones after the spring thaw. Evan squatted at the head of the body and slid his hands underneath his shoulders. Tyler positioned himself to pick up the legs. They gave each other a quick nod and heaved upwards. Evan took a few steps backward and to his left, and they carefully placed Johnny beside Mark Whitesky, Evan's older cousin, who had frozen to death not far from his house a few days earlier. Evan hadn't decided if he thought his cousin had been an accident or if he had killed himself by walking out into the cold. After they had settled Johnny, they surveyed the room to ensure everything was as they left it last time. The makeshift morgue housed 21 bodies lying neatly in three rows. Johnny Megas closed out the third. The garage had room for at least three more, and they could squeeze in more with some rearranging. But with each body, the three friends hoped it would be the last. In the back left corner lay young Jenna and Tara Jones, the first to go. Their bodies were moved here after the leaders had come to the grim realization that there would be more deaths over the winter and that they would need some more cold to keep them until the spring. Soon after, Jacob McLeod was found hanging from a tree in the bush behind his parents' house. Friends said that he'd been overwhelmed by the guilt of letting the young women walk home drunk on a frigid night. They'd been his close friends. His body lay beside theirs. But dispute lingered over what exactly had happened to the girls. Word trickled through the res that Scott somehow got hostile that night. But when asked about it, Cam and Sydney either wouldn't talk about it or they'd say they didn't remember. Scott had allies on the res now, and it was hard to get answers. He and his cronies lived in the duplexes that had been abandoned when families began consolidating as the blackout wore on. Next to Jacob's body, wrapped in old, tattered blue sheets, was his cousin, Dion McLeod. He had shot himself a few days later, near the tree where Jacob had died. One suicide often led to another among the young people, and the compounding tragedies squeezed the stammering heart of the reserve. In the next row were mostly people who had died of natural causes. Many were elderly. Johnny Megas was neatly lined up with the rest of them. Journey well, Johnny, said Tyler.
He's definitely on his way to a better place than this, muttered Isaiah. We don't got to do anything else, do we? You said they had a ceremony at his house, asked Evan. Yeah. Nah, I don't think we got to do anything. Just pay your respects on your own, I guess. Isaiah and Tyler nodded silently. Might as well go home. Evan pulled at the chains to shut the large garage door, shrouding the bodies once again in darkness. He knew they'd be back, likely sooner than later.